we will get going on lecture 18. And uh, this is the last of the lectures that will be on the midterm because the midterm is Monday, so there's no other option really. Um, but today we're going to look at some of the more unusual cases. So we've talked in very general terms about how glaciers can move over land. But remember, we, st we have this class of glacier where they end in the water. And it's worth thinking about how that water interacts with the glacier and allows them to advance and retreat very differently. So we're going to look at tidewater glaciers and ice sheets and how uh, they work. We're also going to look at surges, which is... Uh, something that only very few glaciers do, but every now and again uh, they will advance very, very, very fast um, and then sort of stay where they are for a while. And then lastly, we're going to look at uh, icebergs, what happens when, to that ice once it breaks off. So quiz seven will be available from 3.30 when I can get back to my office. It's been a crazy day. Um, it's only going to be available until 11 a.m. on Monday. Why? Because I would like you to be able to see what you got right or wrong before you take the midterm at two. Okay? So I'm not just chopping off time because uh, I hate you. It's because uh, I want you to be able to see what you got right or wrong. Okay? So remember that. Um, so this is the midterm. It's 2 p.m. on Monday, uh, the correct time this work time round. Um, and it's the same format as last time. It covers the stuff since the last midterm, but there are a few things that I would like you to be familiar with. Um, for example, the fact that our climate is warming and uh, about albedo, things like that. Um, so you'll need pen and pencil, remember your Scantron form, bring your student ID. Uh, the study guide is available on the website. I'll update it when we see how far we get today, because I'm not entirely certain we're going to get to the end. Um, and remember that you can always access your quizzes and have a look at the scores. And for the last, for quizzes one to six, I've reopened them so that you can practice. So for quiz seven, just please take it three times. But for the other quizzes, you can take them as many times as you like um, in, in practice. Um, and I'll have extra office hours on Monday from 9 till 10.30 if you have any last minute panicked questions that you would like me to answer. Does anyone have questions about the midterm? No? Great. In that case, glacier surges. These are really fun, I have to say. And it's what happens when we see a sudden increase in the velocity of our, our glacier. Um, and all of a sudden, we transport a huge amount of ice from the accumulation zone, so from high up on our glacier down to the ablation zone. And that often is, is uh, shown as a very rapid advance of the terminus of the end of that glacier. Okay. Um, and sometimes they occur sort of periodically, so sometimes every 10 years, sometimes every 100 years, sometimes even longer than that. Um, but those are the ones we've been able to observe. And each of the surging glaciers is ever so slightly different. So we can't really sort of say one thing for all of them. We're going to look at one particular case study, um, but some of the triggers for these surges could be something to do with uh, the glacier itself rather than the climate. So all of a sudden, we hit some critical mass, which allows that uh, glacier to suddenly slide where it couldn't before, or to suddenly creep when it couldn't before. It could be that finally we pile enough mass on top that the actual the sediments underneath give way rather than the ice itself. So maybe we hit a critical sort of strength of those sediments. Or we could even see a switch in the water, perhaps going from a more channel system into a more distributed system, sort of supporting the whole ice. And in that case, it would be able to slide. And that's going to be our, our case study. And this is important. Not all glaciers surge. There's a few in Alaska. There's a few on Svalbard, which is a little island north of Norway. Um, but there are relatively few of these around. So what do they do? So they have two phases. So they have the surging phase when they're actually actively advancing down and surging. Um, and it, their sort of speed is usually about 10 times what it would normal be, normally be. So this is a dramatic increase. This isn't sort of speeding up slightly in the summer and slowing down slightly in winter. This is a really dramatic change for this glacier. Um, it's only a short amount of time that it does that. It only does it for maybe days or months. Um, but we see a huge uh, change in the amount of ice and where it is. And in particular, we see an advance often greater than a tenth of the length of the glacier itself. So a really big advance. 
And then we have what we call the quiescent phase, which is the quiet phase when it's not really doing its thing. The speed is relatively slow. Um, and this is sort of that 10 years or 100 years or even longer. That ice movement is relatively small. Um, and so that accumulation zone builds up uh, ice again. And we're losing ice down in the ablation zone. So I think it is helpful to draw this. So we're doing a bit of drawing today. So you may want to dig out some paper and pens. So I'm going to do my best with my relatively limited artistic skills. So first of all, we're going to have a glacier, and it's going to surge down in this direction. Okay. So I'm going to pile up ice up here, and I'm going to have relatively thick ice up in my ablation or so accumulation area. And then as we get down towards the end of the glacier, okay. So this is what our glacier would normally look like, and this is where that end would normally be. And this is in our quiescent phase. So this is when, so this is our solid rock. This is our ice. This is our quiescent phase when the whole ice is really hardly moving. It's maybe moving a little bit. Okay? And what that means is that if here's our sort of equilibrium line, we're losing ice from down here and we're building up ice up here. Now, what's different about these is every sort of 10, 100 years or so, all of a sudden, that extra thickness that has built up, up here in the top part, forces its way down. Okay? And so here we see sort of our ice rapidly moving down the slope. And this is sort of happening really fast. And so what happens is that that keeps going. It keeps sort of moving down. And so the front of the ice actually also extends down away from where it ended before. Okay, so this is our surge phase when we're seeing all of a sudden really rapid movement of ice. Okay? And because we're moving all of the ice from up here, it's going to get thinner. Okay? So after this surge, what we see is actually it's a much more even glacier. It's thinner up here, and it sort of extends down here. Okay? And then the whole thing starts again. So after it's surged, it slows down again. And if it's slowing down again, we're going to be building up more and more ice up here. And down here, if we're not going to be bringing more ice down, it's gradually going to melt back. Okay? So this sort of is gradually going to melt away until our glacier is sort of basically back where it was before. Does that make sense? Yep. So during our sort of quiescent phase, we're building up lots of thickness of ice because it's not moving that fast. During our surge phase, all of a sudden, this extra thickness of ice suddenly races down the glacier at 10 times its normal speed. And that means that down at the bottom, our glacier rapidly extends, really rapidly extends. And then after that sort of surge has happened, the whole glacier is a little bit thinner because we've moved all of our mass from up here down to the end. And then the whole thing starts again. We start making this part thicker. We start melting back here until we get back to the beginning again. And then we start again. Does that make sense? Yep. Yeah. Good. So hopefully that makes sense. So let's look at an example, because these things are fun. So our example is going to be variegated glacier. Um, and it's variegated because it has these funny stripes of uh, ice and then sort of sediment, so it has uh, different colors on the top. And it surged in 1964 to 65. And we went, oh, that's interesting. And so we were looking and sort of monitoring this glacier, and it happened to surge again in 1982 and 83. And this time, and I know that's a really long time ago for you guys, it's only just in my lifetime. Um, so the camera work isn't great, but this time we were able to film it. Um, and so I'm going to show you the little video of this thing um, surging, because I think it's really spectacular. And they've put it to some very dramatic music, which I think actually adds to the whole thing. So this is near the base uh, or the terminus of the glacier. Okay, you can see where the camera is. So keep an eye on the right-hand side. Ha <laughs> ha. 
That's solid rock down here. So I'm going to stop the music because I wanted to tell you what's happening at this side. That I still I really like the music. So this shows what's happening to the water coming out at the base of that glacier. You can see that as that glacier front is advancing, we're seeing a lot of water. Okay, and then look as it slows down. We're getting less, OK? So you can see that there was a sudden burst of water, and then the stream is back to how it was before. And that water gives us a clue, OK? So I think that's really neat. I think that's so fun, um, because you can really see how fast that was moving. You could see those of the day-night cycles. And glaciers don't usually behave that, that way. Okay, um, but this is a really fun example of how they can behave. And that sudden burst of water at the end, just before it slowed down, really gives us a clue about why it suddenly was racing down. The idea is, is that we sort of had a switch in our water distribution at the base of the glacier. So we'll have a look at that in a second. So first of all, is variegated glacier a polar or a temperate glacier, having just watched that video? Any more? Right, let's see how we're doing. What don't we have if it's a polar glacier? Water. Do you remember our polar glaciers are so cold that there's no water at the base? And we saw lots of water there. Okay, so this is an example of a temperate glacier because there's water at the bottom, it's capable of sliding. Okay, And so, yes, we saw a surge in 64, 65, and then again in 82, 83. And unsurprisingly, it surged again in 1995. I couldn't find video for that. But what you can see is that it seems to be something to do with some critical amount of ice. You can see the cumulative mass balance, sort of meters of ice there. And you can see that as it sort of builds up, and then all of a sudden it surges in 1965, and then it suddenly builds up again surges again in 83, surges again in 95. And so there seems to be some critical threshold uh, where all of a sudden that will surge. And what we think is going on is before the surge in that quiescent phase, the glacier moves really slowly and water actually drains through tunnels. So instead of being distributed evenly, it's draining through tunnels. And because the ice is moving so slowly, those tunnels can remain open. And so our accumulation zone gets thicker at the top, and the ablation zone thins out because we're not getting much movement of ice. Um, and then as we start building up more and more and more and more ice in that accumulation zone, eventually our speed of our ice starts getting faster. And then during the surge, what we get is we've built up so much mass that we actually start sort of collapsing those tunnels. We squeeze those tunnels together, and all of a sudden that water isn't flowing in these nice just sort of channels anymore. It now is forced to be underneath the whole of the ice, and it lifts the whole of that ice away from the bed, and all of a sudden we see this massively fast sort of sliding of a lot of that ice down, which is really neat. Okay? And then you saw at the bottom, at the end of that surge, that water all of a sudden escaped at the base. And as it escaped at the base, all of a sudden we released that pressure and so the glacier was able to sit back down onto the sediments again and so it got slower. 
and then the whole process starts again because now that the ice is slower, now our water is going to start draining through channels again rather than underneath the whole thing. So this is uh, one particular example, and if we go to different glaciers, it might behave differently. But it's a really nice sort of example of how things like the, the speed of the glacier, how that water is distributed, things like the strength of the sediments, how it all ties together and controls our glacier. So now let's think about where we have ice interacting with water. So let's think about our tidewater glaciers, which if you remember are where we have valley glaciers that come down and they meet the uh, ocean. And so our terminus, the end of our glacier, actually often isn't floating. It usually is resting on a rock, on sort of, sort of sediment or rock. Okay? And part of that thickness is actually exposed to the ocean. Okay, and so these don't surge, but all of those examples that we were looking at as part of that extreme ice survey, like the Columbia Glacier and another example we're going to look at, these are tidewater glaciers and you saw how quickly they can retreat and how much mass that they're losing by carving. So let's again draw some of what's going on. So... What have I done with my pencil? Here we are. So now let's think of our tidewater glacier coming down from this direction. So here's my rock, and here is my thickness of glacier sort of coming down, and it's going to meet the ocean. Okay? Where it meets the ocean, after it's been traveling down across this rock, it has sort of sediment on the top, sediment within it. Where it starts melting at the front here, where we start breaking ice apart, what we end up doing is depositing large piles of sediment. So here's our underlying rock. Here's sort of our ocean. And what we're doing where we're sort of melting this ice here and where we're breaking sort of big chunks off and sort of getting them to float away as icebergs is that as we do that, we're releasing a lot of that sediment that was either carried along on the top of the glacier or was carried along within it. And all of that sediment builds up, and it builds a little pile in front of the glacier. And what that does is it makes it nice and stable, because instead of all of that whole ice surface being exposed to water, only this little part here is actually exposed to that relatively warm water. And so only this part is sort of melting relatively quickly. Our problem occurs if we start sort of melting our glacier back. So if we imagine that we see a slight change in climate, okay, it doesn't need to be a sort of huge change in climate. If we just thin out our glacier or retreat it a little bit, so if it's now here rather than where it was before, it's moved away from its nice big pile of sediment, which has sort of taken quite a lot of time to build up. And so now, instead of just having this top part exposed to the ocean, now all of that height is exposed to the ocean. Okay? And so instead of just that warm water in contact with the ice here, that warm water is now in contact with the ice all the way down the front. And that means that more of it can melt, and so it's going to retreat even further. So in this place, it's relatively stable. But if we can just get it to retreat a little way away from that pile of sediment, it can become really unstable. And at that point, it retreats very, very rapidly back up the, the valley. Does that make sense? I'm not seeing any response right now. Does that make sense? Yes? Good. OK. And so where do you think it will retreat to? So that's the question. OK? And that's my question for you. Okay, so here's our example of the Columbia Glacier, and you can see that uh, before 1980 it was sort of uh, the sort of furthest point forward in the ocean. And actually, if you look at the ocean floor there, you can see this big line, this big pile of sediment under the water there. And after a certain amount of time, it, it thinned out, it retreated a little bit, and then you can see all of a sudden, in a very short amount of time, it retreated a really long way back. Okay. And then it slowed down a little bit again. 
So, thinking about this, what do you think might happen? So once the tidewater gla glacier starts to retreat a little bit from its stable position, where might it retreat back to? Will it retreat back to another slightly higher point in, say, the rock? Or if there's another pile of sediment, would it retreat back there? Could it retreat back to actually where the glacier meets the ocean originally? Uh, would it retreat all the way back to its equilibrium line? Is it all of the above or just A and B? Okay. So think about it with your neighbor for a second. Talk about which you think it might do. Okay, I think that's more or less everyone. So if you want to place your vote if you haven't done so already. And we'll see what we get. This is a pretty mean question. Good work, guys. You're right. It would be A or B. Okay. So it could retreat. So let's think about two different scenarios. So if that scenario was like I drew it on uh, my uh, sort of piece of paper here. So if my example was like this here, then really there's nothing to interrupt the retreat of that. So it probably just would retreat until it was sort of back where the ocean met the water. But you can imagine a case where if my, uh, the base of my sort of valley here was actually sort of a bit uneven, then if my glacier starts to retreat from this bump, then yes, it'll get sort of deeper here and so be exposed to more water and so melt more. But actually, as it retreats further, it can get to this second bump, okay, where again it would be exposed to less melting. And so it might be that at that point it would be stable again for a while. It sort of depends on what's happening with the, the melting um, and the, the amount of snowfall we're getting. But it could be that if there's a second bump there, it could become stable again um, as that glacier retreats. And so that's sort of one of the interesting things that we need to look at with some of these tidewater glaciers that are retreating so fast. The question is, is it going to stop? If it is going to stop, where is it going to stop? And if it stops, how long is it actually going to stop for? Or if we see ever-increasing temperatures, is it then going to just sort of bypass that bump and keep going backwards? Okay. And so for our example of Columbia Glacier, the one we were just looking at, then we saw that really rapid retreat from the 80s back to sort of the, the 90s and 2000s. Um, and that was sort of maybe 15 kilometers or so. Um, and if we look at what the, the valley floor looks like under the remaining ice, then what we think is going to happen is it's probably going to go back another nine kilometers. And we think it's probably going to hit another point where it would be stable in about 2020. So we'll get to see very soon whether we're right or not. Um, but that's the idea is that we might find this sort of remaining stable point and it might uh, hang around for a while. So we'll see what happens there. And so my second example is a really cool uh, glacier that is draining off Greenland. So Greenland is on the right-hand side here, and then it's sort of coming through a gap in the mountains and into this valley, and then uh, the ocean is off towards the left. And again, you can see that this is a glacier that um, all of a sudden, um, from being fairly stable, um, has retreated a long way. And in particular, you can see that from 1850 to maybe the 1930s, sort of it retreated a very long way. And then it was pretty stable for a while. It didn't really go very far between the, sort of the 30s and the 50s or the 60s. And then all of a sudden, it shot back again and has been retreating very, very quickly. And do you remember uh, I showed you that time lapse or that sort of video of that huge carving event, the biggest we'd ever seen, something the size of Manhattan? This is from that glacier. So that's to put it into perspective. This is a huge glacier. It's probably sort of 6% of the ice coming off Greenland probably comes down through this glacier. And this is actually one of the fastest moving glaciers in the world. Its front probably can sort of travel maybe 40 meters a day at certain times of the year, which is extremely fast. And this is sort of a, a nice little image showing that. So here we can see February 1992. Um, and so again, Greenland is on my right-hand side. The ocean is on the left. And you can see that there's sort of patches of sea ice and patches of icebergs in front of 
where that sort of main carving face is. And then the colours there represent how quickly it's going. And you can see that the ice behind on Greenland is sort of getting channeled into this valley. And as it gets channeled into the valley, it tends to go much faster. It's basically like squeezing toothpaste. Okay, that's the best analogy, I think, on the website I found these images. It's like squeezing toothpaste. Uh, it sort of goes quite fast out of the top. And you can see that in October 2000, actually that whole front was really, really fast. And some of that is probably to do with it being a different time of year. October, there's a lot of meltwater around. It's probably moving more quickly. But also in general, we've seen a huge speed up of this glacier. It's got maybe four times faster um, in recent years. Um, and so we're really interested in what's happening because you can also see what happens to the surrounding areas on Greenland as it speeds up. So on here, you can see that there's really sort of very dark or red colors on Greenland on the far right hand side. But you can see that when that glacier speeds up, when we're squeezing more out through the valley, then actually the surrounding ice on Greenland also starts moving faster. And that's the concern. If we can suddenly speed up our glaciers, then we're not just losing that glacier, we're actually speeding up the transport of all of that ice through and out into the ocean. Okay. So this is ja Jakobshavn. I'm not sure I'm saying that right, um, but it's a very interesting place. And so this is also our concern for ice shelves. So remember that ice shelves are floating. So if I melt an ice shelf, am I going to increase sea level? No, it's already floating. It's like the ice in your drinks again. But what they do do is that they act to hold back glaciers that flow off Antarctica. And we saw what happened if we sped up ja Jakobshaven, if we lost chunks of Jakobshaven, then the ice behind it got faster as well and started flowing out. And the same thing is true for Antarctica. We're not going to raise sea level just by melting our ice shelves and breaking them off. But if we get rid of that nice ice that sat around those ice shelves, then all of a sudden the glaciers that are on land behind them can suddenly speed up and they will dump extra ice into the ocean and that will increase our sea level. Okay, so it's all tied together. Um, and so here are our ice shelves, including uh, Larsen C in the Wilkins ice, ice shelf and the Wilkins is very nearly gone at this point. Um, and again, this is something that you've already seen, but uh, the fact that we've, we're starting to see these ice shelves collapse. And what happens is we see sort of meltwater on the surface and that meltwater basically just sort of melts its way down and we sort of see big cracks forming in the ice shelf and eventually it can break away um, and float out to sea. And that's a problem when you have a giant ice shelf because these things take a long time to melt and there may not be a lot of shipping around uh, Antarctica, but there's enough that you wouldn't want it to float into a big shipping lane. Um, so the concern with these is that they have been around and stable for a very long time. We are starting to lose them. And the question is how much those glaciers behind them will speed up and how quickly they will dump extra ice into our ocean. Okay, so that's our interesting question there. So let's think about icebergs. So we've got the rest of today to think about icebergs because we're going to do some more math. And I know everyone is thrilled about that. So land ice and icebergs. So remember, this is not sea ice. This is still land ice. It just happens to have fallen into the ocean. Um, and so you can see that we have our little iceberg floating there. But actually, it probably looks something more like that. Okay. Remember that a huge amount of our ice, probably sort of 90% of our ice, is actually under the water. You only see a tiny little bit of that iceberg above the water. Okay, so remember that. And so what do they do? They tend to drift around. They move with ocean currents, they move with the wind, because if they're sticking up above the water, as the wind blows, they will be carried in a certain direction. 90% of their volume is underwater. If they hit shallow water, therefore, then they can become stuck for a while, at least until they melt away a little bit more. Okay? And they tend to melt fastest near the water line. Do you think they'll melt more above the water or below the water? If you were off the coast of Antarctica, do you think the air would be colder or the water would be colder? Probably the air. So actually that water, do you remember, it takes a lot of energy to warm up or cool down the ocean. Um, and so that ocean water is relatively warm by Antarctic standards. 
And so actually we're going to see more melting of the ice under the water. And so our iceberg doesn't just sit there like your nice ice cube and, and sort of melt away. Ice is a really irregular shape. And if we're melting lots of what's under the water and leaving behind the stuff that's on top, then sooner or later it becomes top heavy and it rolls. Okay? Um, and so I have a fun couple of videos to show you of uh, icebergs rolling. And this is why, again, just like you don't want to get near the front of uh, a large uh, ice shelf, then you don't necessarily want to get that close to a big iceberg either, because they tend to dramatically roll over. So you can see how much of that ice was underneath the water there. And then it re rolls for a while. And in terms of scale, it's impressive, but it's not that impressive. Let's look at a really big iceberg. OK, so this iceberg is huge. Note the little boat for scale. <laughs> if I were them, I'd be a little bit more worried, I think, than they seem to be. So this is a big iceberg. Um, and it's, just because it's big doesn't necessarily mean it's stable. It's still going to follow those same patterns. And so you can see still, it's still moving back here. And this is huge. This is a really big ice sheet. And I promise you that the people on the boat were fine. But if you skip forward a little bit, you can see the wave coming towards these guys. And it took a while to arrive as well. This iceberg's a long way away. so. Anyway, just to show with that we're not necessarily always thinking about the same scale. So I think someone sent me a really cool link to someone that wants to show the effects of climate change by living on an iceberg for a year. It's a nice idea in theory, but I'd be a bit worried that it might do something like that, and it might tip him off somewhere. So we'll see. So we're going to talk about Archimedes. I can hear the excitement from here. And we're going to talk about uh, buoyancy and weight. And what we're going to do is prove to ourselves that 90% of the iceberg is underneath the water. Okay? We're going to show relatively simply why that's the case. So first of all, Archimedes' law basically says that uh, the weight sort of pulling an object down um, is going to be sort of uh, equal to this force pushing back, this buoyancy force pushing this object back up again. Okay? So we can write that as that buoyancy equals the weight of the fluid that's displaced. Okay? So our weight of our object pushing down is going to be equal to the buoyancy, which is equal to the weight of the fluid that has been displaced by that object. Okay. So what is weight? Mass times gravity. Someone's awake on the front. I like it. Mass times gravity. How did we work out our mass? Density times. Probably volume. OK, so before we did the height. So you got it right. Great. So, <laughs> um, so what we can do is we can say that our weight of seawater displaced by our iceberg is equal to the weight of the iceberg. Okay? And weight equals volume <coughs> times density times gravity. So here I have some horrible looking terminology, which is basically just what we said. So I now have given a symbol to the density of seawater. So our little sort of funny P with SW. I've given a density to the ice, which is P with a little i after it. I've said that the total volume of the ice is V 
total. And I've said that the volume of the submerged ice is V submerged. Okay. So remembering that weight equals math, uh, volume times density times the gravity, can you write me a little equation that e equals the weight of the seawater versus the weight of the ice? Okay, so I'll give you a couple of minutes. So think about how you would write that equation down. So what is the weight of my iceberg going to be? How would we write that using the terms I've put up here? What's my formula for weight? Yep, volume times gravity times density. What's the volume for just the iceberg? What, what volume am I interested here? V total. What I'm interested is the whole volume of ice. If I'm going to think about the weight of the iceberg, I want to think about the whole volume of ice. What density am I going to use? The density of ice, okay? And uh, then it's going to be times gravity. What am I going to think about with the weight of the seawater displaced? What volume of seawater have I displaced? The only other V on there, right, is the V submerged. So if that's how much volume of ice there is under the water, that's going to be how much water I made go somewhere else, right? Okay. What uh, is the density I'm going to use for seawater? Seawater, sea okay. So I think I'm making this more complicated than it is. So the weight of seawater displaced is that volume of ice that is now sort of displaced the seawater, so V sub, times the density of seawater times by gravity. And that is equal to the weight of our iceberg, which is the total volume times the density of ice times gravity. Is everyone with me this far? Yes? It's not as bad as you thought, right? Maybe. OK, so I'm not going to give up on you guys. So simple rearranging of formulas. Can you cancel and rearrange this formula to get it so that it's V sub over V total equals something? Okay, and I'm not going to give up on you. You guys are definitely going to do this one for me. Okay, so what can we do first off to make our life easier? Cancel out G, right? We have G on both sides. We don't need G on both sides. We can cancel it out, okay? So if we, let me write this down, I think. So the first thing we can do, we have G on both sides, we can get rid of it, okay? We don't need our G anymore. So now we're just left with V sub times the density of seawater equals the volume total times the density of ice. And I want to get V sub divided by V total, okay? So all I need to do there is divide this side by V sub, and then what is that going to equal? What's going to be on the, the top here? Is it going to be the density of seawater or the density of ice? ice? It's going to be ice, OK? It's going to be the density of my ice, OK? So we've just moved this over here, so that equals the density of ice. And then it's going to be divided by the density of seawater, OK? So what we've done is just bring that over there, and we've brought that down there, OK? So V sub over V total is equal to the density of ice over the density of seawater. 
And what is actually V sub over V total? What actually is that telling us? Yeah, absolutely. It's the percentage that's underneath the water, right? If we're saying the volume of the submerged bit over the total volume, we're basically working out the fraction that is actually underneath uh, the water. Okay? So that uh, the submerged volume divided by the total volume. So I've given you some numbers here. Okay? So let's say our density of ice is 920. Uh, kilograms per meter cubed, okay? Because do you remember, ice is less dense than water. It's why it floats, okay? Because we have that big hexagonal open structure. So our molecules aren't packed together quite so much. And then our density of seawater is something like 1,028 kilograms per meter cubed. So if we put those numbers into our formula, then we get something like 0.895 we turn that into a percentage just by multiplying it by 100, then we get 89.5%. It's 90%. So we've really simply worked out that 90% of our ice has to be underwater just by using the, the density ratio there. Okay? So it suddenly makes a whole bunch of sense. Hopefully. Does everyone follow that? Yes? Okay. I know it's a Friday, so it's a lot to throw at you. So as a reward for doing hard math, I'm going to give you a treat. But first, if the volume of ice above the water is 100 meters cubed, and remember 90% is below, what volume of water would be below the, ice, uh, the water? Okay. So if we have 100 meters cubed above my water, what am I going to have underneath? OK, last few seconds. Right, let's take a look. Sixty-five percent of us have it. If ninety percent is underwater, is there going to be more underwater or more above the water? More underwater, so it can't be ninety because there'd be less. Don't pack up yet. I have a whole bunch of stuff to show you. <laughs> what is the most famous iceberg? The Titanic. The Titanic. So let's take a look at our Titanic. So our Titanic, for those of you that may not have seen the movie, and we're doing King of the World over in the corner, absolutely. Um, it sank in 1912 after colliding with an iceberg. And remember, we didn't have planes there, here. This was the only way across the Atlantic. And this is still why we monitor icebergs today. Okay? So this is where our little Titanic went. It left from Southampton. It called in an island then made it most of the way across to New York, and that cross marks where it sank. So just off the coast of Newfoundland there. Okay? And so today, it's not looking quite so glamorous. You can't do the I'm the king of the world type thing. So let's think about where our iceberg could have come from. Do you remember Jakobshaven? It actually probably came from there. Because do you remember I said this thing is huge? You saw that time lapse of this sort of Manhattan sized blocks falling off the front. It's draining a huge amount of the ice coming off Greenland. And so, probably a good percentage of the icebergs floating along that coast came from this glacier. And you can see the pattern of, of currents there. So, Jakobshaven, in terms of Greenland, is actually it's on this side over here somewhere. So, you can see the, the glacier coming down here. And so it's on this side. And so what happened was an iceberg will have fallen off the front. It will have spent some time sort of circulating around up here. But then it will have got caught up in this current. And it will have been carried down here. And what does that arrow seem to coincide with? If we look at where that arrow ends up, it's basically where our Titanic was. Okay? And so this particular part of the coastline is actually sort of plagued by icebergs. And so you do have to be a bit careful if you're uh, shipping around there. Okay? And so we do actually have an international sort of organization that does ice patrol. It tracks where these big icebergs are, not little ones, but it tracks the big ones. And it puts out reports. Um, and you can go there and you can see how many icebergs we have floating off the coast right now and where you should be careful. Okay, great. Thanks, guys. I will see you on Monday.